How's everybody doing today? Y'all doing all right? Awesome. Well, hey, welcome everybody. So glad to be back with you all here today. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, or if this is your first time here and you're new, uh, like he said, my name is Jace Hargrove, and I get the honor and privilege of working with that ministry that he was talking about, Idols Aside Ministries. And what we do is we minister to fatherless youth in, 20, in, in over 20 schools in Western Kentucky here, and we get to go in weekly with our Bibles, and we get to disciple young boys and young girls that don't have active dads in their life. And so outside of the school, we do. We have an amazing hunting lodge where, out in Ballard County where we take them on hunting, uh, hunting and fishing retreats, and we've been going on the lake this summer. We're going to be doing that all summer long. But I also used to serve as a pastor here on staff. And so this place uh, has such a special place in my heart. I love this place. I love the people. I love all of you. And anytime Pastor Mark invites me to come speak, it's a no-brainer for me. Even if today is my birthday and he's making me work. (laughs) But that's all right. I'm going to go to Venture River after this and I'm going to work on my tan. You know what I'm saying? And he told me y'all are in this series called Summer of Love. And uh, I listened to Pastor Alex's sermon last Sunday in church. He did awesome for his first time on this, the main platform. Y'all should be so proud of him. I, I took him out to lunch this week and I told him uh, while we're eating, I was like, bro, I was just impressed that you contained your fast talking Memphis. Like people <laughs> understood you, like it was awesome. So praise God, he is a miracle worker. And, uh, but seriously, He set the series up so well with his introduction of what was going on in this book and going on during this time period. And he even explained what Gnosticism is, which we'll bring up a little bit today. So if you missed that last week, you need to go back and watch it. It was absolutely incredible. But today we're going to look at the second half of chapter one uh, of 1 John, verses 5 through 10. And I've titled the sermon something that I know we all must do. And that is step into the light. So we're going to read our passage together. Since you've got your Bible, you can open up to to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. We're going to read it together. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive right in. If you're ready, say ready. ready. This is what it says. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. They gave me a fun one to preach today, church. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that we just read together. Lord, we know that you are here meeting with us. And Father, I pray that I would just be obedient to whatever you want to speak. Uh, Lord, anything that I have planned, may it come straight from you. And if, if you have something you want to say, Lord, would I just be obedient uh, to hear from your Holy Spirit. Now may your message not fall on deaf ears. May we be attentive to the words that you're speaking to us today. And may you be glorified above all else. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, a lady named Joanna lived her entire life in a dark cave. She'd never seen light, at least not pure light anyways, and there would be like little glimmers of light that would reach her here and there. If Maybe it was a fish that glowed, or maybe it was a glimpse of the outside world if she uh, got too close to the edge of the cave, or maybe there was an occasional traveler that would walk by with a headlamp on their head, and she would, she would get a little bit of light. Now, Joanna and other people, they, they lived in this massive cave. They lived their entire life in darkness. They stumbled along trying to make their way through the cave the best that they could in the blackness. You know, some of the people, um, they actually would die to their death from falling. Um, Some would get bitten by poisonous creatures. Some would twist their ankles on the rocks all because they couldn't see in the dark. They daily They'd be walking around some of the most beautiful uh, creations of rocks and, and shining diamonds and crystals and formations, yet they had no idea that they were walking around it because they couldn't see them in the dark. 
They remain completely oblivious to this breathtaking colors and design and these dazzling designs. And as odd as it may sound, these people lived in darkness by choice. I know it sounds crazy, right? Like, why would somebody choose to stumble around in what we call the scary darkness? Why would somebody choose not to see? Why would they choose that? Well, although very few of them admitted that this was the reason, the people chose the darkness because they didn't want to see themselves as they really were. In the darkness, they had convinced themselves that they were clean, they were healthy. They didn't want to admit that that wasn't true at all. Light showed them things as they really were. It showed them all the dirt over their skins. It showed them the dried up blood covering their bodies, the, the oozing stuff coming from the uncared for wounds that hadn't, hadn't healed properly, all the sores and diseases that ravaged their bodies. It showed them with their mangled hair and their weak eyes and in short, it just shows them that, that they're a mess. But had they only realized the healing and the life that could be theirs, if they were only willing to step into the light, they wouldn't have hesitated for a moment. Had they only understood that their present life in the dark cave only ended in death, would they have raced into the life that the light wanted to offer them? But instead, they refused. They lived in darkness, and they actually loved it rather than living in the light of life. But why do I mention this? Because light is an amazing thing. Without it, we don't know how to walk safely. Nor can we see the beauty that is surrounding us. Light shows us things as they truly are. It reveals the truth about ourselves and the world around us. And as we just read in verses 5 through 10, there are people in this world living in darkness, never realizing that God is light, that God is truth, there is no darkness in him, and that there is life and healing found in his light. Come on, church, I need you to wake up. Like, I'm just getting warmed up. Like, I need y'all to, I need y'all to engage with me. There is life and healing found in the light that God offers us, and he reveals it to us in his word, in the Bible. Today, are we honestly willing to let God show us the truth? Even if it's initially uh, unpleasant, even if it hurts a little bit, are you willing to step into the light? And in this first chapter, John is reminding us that true fellowship with God requires us to walk into the light, to live transparently and honest before God, our creator, the one who made us, that our life is about aligning it with his truth, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's challenging to us. And y'all are in this series called Summer of Love, and here's what we have to understand and grasp if that's going to happen. If we are going to love properly, we first have to align ourselves with God's truth properly. If you're going to have a summer of love, that is what is going to have to happen. And I'm hoping and praying that you grasp that today. And that only happens through authenticity. Verse 6 says, we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. John is saying that those who verbally say they're living for Christ... Yet they keep living in spiritual darkness of sin and they're never growing in the light. They aren't living their life authentic, uh, authentic, authenticity. They're not. Authenticity? Yeah, they're not living in authenticity. See? <laughs> Asians, man. I always blame it on being Asian because I got broken English, but I'm too redneck for that. <laughs> but those people aren't practicing the truth. It's like claiming to love that you love living in a bright house with lots of natural light coming in through the windows, but in actuality, you just keep all the lights turned off and you have blackout curtains that you never open up. How can God be light with no darkness in him? And we, when we confess that Jesus is Lord and we commit our life to him, God's presence now dwells in us, right? Yet there are people professing to live a Christian life, living in this world that are hiding in sin, staying in the shadows, never stepping into the light to, to get healing that they need. Acts 17, 24 says that God doesn't live in temples built by man. That means that he doesn't live in this building that we're sitting in here today. We, he, his presence lives in us. His presence dwells in us, the temple of his creation, not temples made by man's hands. The dwelling place of the Holy Spirit is is inside of us. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't hear me wrong. 
I'm not saying if we have God's Holy Spirit in us that we're no longer going to sin and somehow we're going to live a perfect life. We won't see perfection until we get on the other side of this life. And life doesn't end here for the believer. Life is forever. Life is eternal. Life is in the presence of our Creator. That's why later, uh, even though we won't see perfection here on this side of earth, that's why later we'll look at what John says in verse 8 saying, if we claim to not sin, the truth isn't in us. It's not. He's not saying you're not going to sin. But here in verse 6, what he's doing is he's addressing the inconsistency between claiming to have fellowship with God while simultaneously walking in the darkness. Not living any different than you did when you were a sinner living uh, without the knowledge and presence of God living in your life. Because you see, authentic faith is, isn't just about what we claim. It's about how we live it out. Your, your authentic faith that you've been claiming to live, but you're not living it out, that's not authentic. That's not real. It's filtered. It's phony. It's not really how you say you live. I'll put it to you another way. Authentic faith doesn't claim you'll sin no more. Authentic faith claims you won't hide it from God anymore. That's authentic faith. That's not living in the shadows and in the darkness. That's exposing it and stepping into the light. Even if it's hard, even if it's a harsh reality of what you look like, live like, all of these things, you have to move from an inauthentic faith to an authentic faith. That's how you live it out. Don't hide it from God anymore. He sees it all. Come out of hiding. But here's what I think is the problem, church. I think we love the ideas of our sins being forgiven, but we're afraid of stepping out of the darkness of our sin and actually exposing into the light because it hurts to be honest. It hurts to be honest about messing up. Maybe it hurts about that addiction to be honest about or that struggle that you have with porn or lust or whatever it may be. But you know what? Roses don't grow in the dark. Fungus does. Nobody wants their life to look like fungus. And if you're ever going to grow and heal and see your life grow into something beautiful, then you are going to have to step into the light. Man, that sounds harsh. You don't think my life's beautiful? I got a good job. I've got a good family. I've got all the things. We live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. I'd say my life is pretty beautiful. I'd say all that's awesome if it's all built around Jesus. But if you have all those things that equate to the world's idea of beauty, and yet spiritually you and your family live in spiritual darkness, then I'd say what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, let you your, lose your whole soul? Oh, Is anything worth more than your soul? Because things aren't worth more than your soul, church. Sports scholarships for your kids are not worth more than their soul. I see it all the time, parents prioritizing sports over their kids' relationship with God. I see adults placing their 401k that's not worth more than your soul above your family, above God. You say you work, work, work trying to achieve. None of that stuff is worth more. It's not. Yeah, I know it can be scary to open up and be honest about your sin and your struggles. But let me tell you something. If you cry out to Jesus, whoever you are in here today, if you do that and you tell him every single dark, dirty, uh, shameful thing that you've ever done in your life and you're completely honest with, uh, with God, he's not going to be up there and go, oh my gosh, I did not know that about you. This changes everything. Go away. He's, God's not going to do that. He's going to say, welcome, my child. He's going to say, welcome to the light. He's going to say, I've been waiting for you to be honest. I want you to know that I forgive you and I love you. And me personally, I love the way that uh, stepping into the sunlight makes me feel. When I'm feeling bad, you know what? I just want to go get into the sun because it makes me feel warm. It makes me feel energized. Imagine how much more stepping into the light of our Savior, our Creator, the one who created light. Imagine how much more energizing and refreshing that is. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. 
I don't know why I did the Wakanda forever. <laughs> Listen, Jesus said in Luke 8, no one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl or tries to hide it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open and everything that is concealed will be brought to the light and made known to all. Don't try to hide what's already going to be found out. The light of life that Jesus offers us is for our benefit. It's beneficial so that all who are around us, all who God puts in front of us, they can be positively affected by his light that is shining through you. That's the summer that you need. A summer of love in light, in his light. Not Kentucky Lake's light, Jesus' light. David said in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light, my salvation. Why should I be afraid? Why should anybody be afraid? That's the truth, church. Why should we be afraid of the light? The devil wants to convince every unbeliever and even believers in here that we should be afraid to come to God with our sins and our mess ups and our doubts and our shames, that we should cover up our sins, that we should just act like life is good. The lie is that you have to be perfect in order to bring yourself to God. For him to accept you, that is a lie. The truth is, you can look like you have it all together on the outside, yet on the inside, it's dark and it's dead and nothing good is going on the inside. The truth is, God wants you to step into the lights. Don't be afraid. And if we're not actively pursuing truth, we're passively accepting lies. Lies that the enemy has been speaking over you for years. He did it in the beginning with Adam and Eve. What did the devil do? He came and said, did God really say you shouldn't eat of this tree? Man, God's just keeping something from you. He's just, is he really as caring and does he really love you as much as he says? If he did, why, why Eve? Why is he telling you not to eat it? Just go ahead. It'll open up your eyes. You'll see it all. You'll know all the mysteries that God's been keeping from you. It worked on them. Why wouldn't he try to do the same thing on us? And so if you're not actively pursuing the truth that's in God's word, in his Bible, you are going to passively accept the lies that come from the father of lies. And if we're not practicing the truth, I'll put it to you like this. It's like trying to drive with your eyes closed. It's dark and you're surely going to crash. I tried that with my wife one time. I closed my eyes. We were driving. She slapped me. She's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just trying to impress you. She wasn't impressed. She called me an idiot. I was just trying to see, you know, my mic game isn't very good anymore. But verse 7 says, if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. I told you at the beginning of this message, if we are going to love properly, we have to align with God's truth properly, right? And God's truth is that Jesus' blood, it not only covers our sin, but it cleanses us from all unrighteousness when we walk in fellowship with him. Where? In the light. In the light. Remember what Pastor Alex talked about last week. Gnosticism was taking root within the church that John was writing to. They believed that there was this secret knowledge that everybody can attain. People are still doing the same thing today. We hear it like this. Maybe you've heard it worded like this. Well, you just got to live your life until you find yourself, until you discover yourself. The secret to life is within you. You just have to unlock it. Y'all have heard some things similar to that. So philosophers back then were teaching Gnosticism. They were teaching this and people were believing that Jesus was not a real physical person that walked on this earth, that he was just a spirit that we all could unlock and know. It was another God to add to the list of gods. 
They believe that everybody possess a piece of the divine nature within them. They just have to find it. They believe it was all about the spirit. So if the body sinned, it really did not matter how you lived your life with your body. Therefore, the confessing of sins and living a true Christian life, that wasn't all that important to these people that believed in Gnosticism. And because of that, it led to spiritual pride in people. And they had a lack of love uh, among the early church. That's why John is going to be writing so much throughout this book about love. And later in this series, y'all will dive more intentionally into that. But here in this beginning, first chapter, John is trying to get them to understand that Jesus was in fact a real, tangible person who performed real miracles and made the true ultimate sacrifice and literally died on the cross for them. It reminds me of second uh, or of Colossians 2 verse 2 where Paul was writing in the Colossians they all thought that there was this big mystery of God. You've probably heard people talk about if you're any in any kind of like Bible knowledge or theology or things like that. People like to talk about the mystery of God and how nobody knows the mysteries of God. Well, you know what? Colossians literally answers that for us. Colossians 2 2 says this that in their hearts They may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery. That's where they get hung up. What's what's God's mystery? Comma. Which is Christ? There's the answer. Comma. Verse 3 and 4. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. There's not a mystery. The mystery that they were trying to learn and understand, it was Jesus Christ. These people all thought that they had to sacrifice things and do things in order to be cleansed. That's why John is writing and telling them that Jesus was real, that his death, burial, and resurrection was real, that he died for their sins, that he was God that stepped down and he sent his son. And for them to act as though they have this enlightened faith, but live through the sac- as though the sacrifice never happened, like Gnosticism teaches, that is what it means to spiritually live in darkness. That's why he's addressing it like that. And like the Colossians stated, Jesus Christ was the knowledge. He is the knowledge. The mystery that people thought was unattainable. The thing that people today, when they're saying, I'm just trying to find myself, I'm trying to discover myself, I'm trying to unlock that thing inside of me, they don't understand that it's Jesus. And I say all that to say this, and this was something when I was talking to my wife about um, my sermon this week, and I was just helping her kind of, I asked her to help me with, with this part of my message. This, so this is something that she came up with. This is her words, not mine. You can amen her. Um, <laughs> She said this, to know this knowledge, Jesus, that's Jesus, to know this knowledge is to know truth. To know truth is to live changed. To live changed is to truly love one another. That's a good word. Somebody's somebody's in the background doing that. To know this knowledge is to know truth. To know truth is to live changed. To live changed is to truly love one another. When you step into the light, you step into his truth. When you step into the light, you step into life change. When you step into the light, you step into love. And that love turns into a love for other people. It turns into a hate of sin where we don't claim we have no sin, but now we feel convicted every time that we do it. And we start to hate it inside of us. And we don't just brush it off of our shoulder. We give it to God every single day because we know that his mercy is new every single morning and we know that we're going to mess up but we just trust in him and we give it to him and we die to ourselves daily and we pick up our cross and we follow him daily because church verse 8 says if we claim we have no sin we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth and when we deny our sinfulness in our life we're essentially saying I don't need Jesus that I didn't need his death on the cross. That was a waste of time. What a dark place that is to be spiritually. 
And I think there's somebody in here today that has bought into the lie that if you give up your sin and you become a Christian, your life is going to become boring and it's going to be lame and you'll just have to sit at home and twiddle your thumbs and you'll never have any fun because Christians have all these rules and they have all these things that the Bible says you can't do. It does, like you have to restrain yourself. But let me tell you, if you are living your life believing that, you're already living in a lie if you believe it. Because being a Christian for me, it has allowed me to have more fun and experience more life than I have ever experienced when I was sinning and I was partying and I was sleeping around and I was drinking and I was doing all these things. You know what? I was a good person. I was respectable in my town. I was, I was the person that everybody liked and everybody looked to. But you know what? I was still a sinner. I was still broken. I didn't have the life that a lot of my friends in the school that I saw were going to church. I thought they were weird for doing that. My family didn't grow up in church. I didn't hear about the Bible when I was a kid. I walked through some stuff. I had to step out of the darkness and step into the light. I don't need parties, bars, fancy things to enjoy life. All I need is Jesus, and that's the life that he offers me, and I'll take it any day. And maybe you're here, and you're one of the nicest, greatest people, and everybody loves you. Maybe you've got that same story. But don't fool yourself into believing that that is good enough and that you're not a sinner that needs a savior. You still need forgiveness. You still need a savior. You still need the truth. You still need to step into the light. You still need to confess your sins to God. And if you do that, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Things won't change if you don't confess, if you don't get honest. At some point, you have to confess. You have to make that decision at some point. If not, the only other option is hell. <laughs> that don't sound too fun. <laughs> not for me. And I've already told you, it can be scary because it's a moment of vulnerability. It's a moment where you're raw. But when you read a verse like this, doesn't it give you at least some level of hope? Some level of reassurance? It says he is faithful and just to forgive us. It doesn't say if we confess our sins to him, he is disappointed and just to turn away from us and deny us. He loves us too much to do that. If he was disappointed in us, and just to turn away from us, that means him sending his son to this earth to die for us was pointless. That his son, you know what he was? He was the propitiation for our sin. That yes, we are guilty. Our punishment should be death. We shouldn't be able to be forgiven. But Jesus stood before the father and the judge and said, take your wrath out on me instead. He did that so that you could live. And now we read this passage in 1 John and all he says is we have to step into the light, receive that forgiveness, receive cleansing. And for the people in here who have been afraid of what might happen if you step into the light, don't be afraid of it any longer. Because confession is a need that we all have and it eats us alive inside if we don't. But I want you to know this. The necessity of confession is always met with the promise of forgiveness. That's what verse 9 is all about. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Robert Louis Stevenson grew up in Scotland. Now, you may not be familiar with that name, but you're probably familiar with some of his works. Uh, he's most famously known for writing um, the Treasure Island and then Mr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde or Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde. And in those days of his youth, streetlights, uh, kids, didn't come on by themselves. There was no electricity. And so people were hired 
uh, to light each one of those street lamps individually. And one evening as the lamp lighters were doing their job and they were climbing ladders, they were lifting the glass lid off, they were taking a torch and lighting uh, the lamps and they would shut the lid and they would climb down and they would move on to the next one doing this over and over and over again. This captured the attention of a young Mr. Stevenson. And as dusk settled into the night, this would be repeated over and over until all of the street light or the darkness was expelled. And young Stevenson turned to his, his parents and he said, look, they're punching holes in the darkness. And that's a beautiful image of what can happen for people if we allow God, who is light, into our life. For the person who isn't a believer in Jesus Spiritually, you're living in darkness. You're walking down the streets of life without any light to guide your path. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. Eventually, we're going to die. And John is here writing, saying that there are people in this world who believe they are in fellowship with God, yet they're hanging out in the shadows, not truly allowing God's light to shine in areas of your life. You're not practicing the truth. You're not allowing the light to punch holes in your darkness. But God loves you so much. And this book is about that love. And he doesn't want you to just know that. He wants you to live in that. And we've been trained throughout our entire life to be afraid of what happens if we're honest about messing up. Maybe that's a parenting problem. I don't know. But I do know we should all look at the model that God has set for us and create an environment where these kids that are growing up can feel confident enough to approach us with mess ups. We can't be so hard on these kids uh, that when they mess up, they're too ashamed and afraid to talk to us. Because kids that grow up like that will grow up and one day view God as somebody that they can't be honest with, somebody that they can't go to, somebody that they can't step into the light with. Because it's inevitable. They are going to mess up. It's inevitable. You're going to mess up from time to time. But if you're so afraid to talk to God about that stuff, then no wonder you don't feel like he loves you. No wonder you have a hard time opening up. No wonder you keep drinking and doing drugs and having sex. No wonder you keep on living in darkness, portraying to the world on social media that you have it all together when that life is so good and you're so happy, yet you go home every night and you battle depression and anxiety and you're afraid to tell anybody the truth. It feels like you're at war within yourself when you go home and you're all alone. It's because you haven't stepped into the light. It's because you're hiding from the one who already knows everything about you. Listen, this week, I had a boy in our ministry here locally, here in the Paducah area, a kid I've been doing life with, a kid whose dad was killed at a young age, who's grew up his entire life fatherless, has been raised by his grandparents his entire life. This week, his granddad took his own life. I don't know why he did it. I don't know if he still grieved the loss of his own son that happened years ago where he was killed. I know he loved the Lord. He was a deacon at his church. He did Bible studies with the young man every day, but I don't know what battle he was facing in his head. I know I wish he would have opened up to us those times that we spent with him, those moments that we were around him. I, I know I wish he would have been honest with somebody I know I wish he wouldn't have stayed in the shadows of his struggles. I just wonder what would have happened if he would have exposed it to the light. If he would have just given it to God, no matter what it was. Because suicide is not the answer. It's not the unforgivable sin. So I know he's in heaven being held by God right now. But now there's a 15-year-old boy who is confused and hurt. Talked to him on the phone yesterday for a long time. A boy that's having to do everything he can not to lean into his own understanding. And maybe there's somebody here today that has battled suicidal thoughts and maybe needs to hear this today. It's not the answer. Come out of the shadows. Come out of hiding. Step into the light. Because church, God's light exposes what we hide, but it also heals what we confess. God's light will expose that darkness but it's met with the promise of forgiveness. It's met with the promise of healing. He wants to welcome you today. Aren't you ready to experience that healing? Aren't you ready to experience liberation? 
freedom from your sin, the weight of it, the thing that's been pushing you down and keeping you down from walking in it. Because you see, the enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to get everybody to have a misunderstanding of their identity. If you can't get your identity right, you'll never get your purpose right. I think of Romans 1.1 where Paul starts writing the letter and he says, I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel. He introduces himself with his identity, a servant of Christ. Then he goes to his calling. He was called to be an apostle. That was his calling, his purpose. How does he do it? He does it by preaching the word of God to people. He does it by pushing forward the gospel. That is it. His identity is a believer in Jesus. His identity is a servant of Jesus Christ. His purpose was called to be an apostle, but he does it through preaching. Don't get your identity messed up. Healing begins when confession begins. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I need you to hear me. The light of this world stepped down into our darkness, stepped down into our mess, our chaos, our sin, our depravity. He came down and showed us that he is the only way to the Father. And he promises us that if you will just start to follow him today, you will never walk in darkness again. You'll never be separated from his love. The darkness in your heart, it will be cast out and replaced by the light of his love, his truth, his sacrifice. And all you have to do today is get honest with God. God, confess your sins and step into the light. You'll have a new life, a new beginning. You'll be born again. Don't wait. Go all in. Go all in with your honesty. Go all in with your confession. Go all in with your relationship with God and watch how he just pours out his blessings over your life. And then when you give your life to Christ, get into a community of other believers so that they can pour into you and they can check on you and they can care for you and you can experience the true design that God has for your relationship with him and your relationship with others. That's the summer of love that you need. And now's your opportunity to start. Have you done that today? If it's you, it's time to move. I'm going to pray. And while I'm praying, all eyes are going to be closed. I invite the prayer team to go ahead and come down front now. Come and talk to one of them while I'm praying and everybody's eyes are closed. Move while the Spirit is moving. Don't quench the Spirit in your life in this moment. God wants to completely punch out darkness in your life. He wants to replace it with the light of life. Jesus has already died for you, church. Just accept it.